Well, right now I would like to kind of move on to our final talk for the day. And I think it's one of the most important ones that we have done uh, today. This is what I'd like to kick off our drug development uh, Duchenne Roundtable discussion. And as you all can see, we have our three panelists here. And we've got uh, John Wing from PTC Therapeutics, Dr. Craig Zedman from Washington University, and Josh Librand, who is the father of our national ambassador, Ethan. Um, many of you might know Ethan from all his jokes. Uh, who knows? But um, he is a super great kid, and we couldn't be any more fortunate to have him as our national ambassador. He's got a great spirit, as especially um, you know with Duchenne and so forth. He has just he's got a great personality. And so basically with our panel discussion here today, you know, we kind of want to talk about why drug therapy is so, drug development is so important. And, you know, what are some obstacles that companies face developing drugs for certain diseases and, you know, what makes a certain company develop for certain diseases, rare diseases. So um, I just like to go ahead and kick it off. Um, Josh, I can start with you if you want, if you want to go ahead and tell the audience just a little bit more about yourself. I know you're more than just Ethan's dad. <laughs> well, yes, I am Ethan's dad and thank you all for having me today. And me and my wife, Jordan, we've been married for 13 years. We have a, our daughter, she's 10, her name's Chloe and Ethan's 12, he's our oldest. And my wife's an assistant principal at a local high school and okay. I'm a former special ed teacher, so. Nice, well, thanks for being here. Craig, you wanna go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, this is the first time I've been asked to talk at a webinar like this, I'm very excited. Um, um, it's an honor. Um, I am a pediatric neuromuscular uh, physician I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. I have been in practice 15 years. Um, I am the director of our pediatric neuromuscular clinical research unit. Um, we're engaged in clinical trials with, I think, last count 10 investigational products at this point. I think we have about 45 clinical trial participants, and that's just on the pediatric side. Um, there's a little adult wing as well. Um, I'm devoted to the care of children with neuromuscular diseases. That's all I do. And um, Anyway, I'm also a father of three. My oldest is a rising senior and we're doing the whole college tour and we've got two girls after him. And um, my wife and my kids may wander behind me at some point, so. <laughs> That's okay. Please excuse that. Well, I'm glad you could be with us this afternoon. Thank you. I know it's a Saturday for everybody and I appreciate your time. John, right. you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, yep. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is John Wing. I'm the lead medical science liaison for PTC Therapeutics. Um, I have a PhD in molecular biology. I've been in the sciences since 1992. I grew up as a lab rat. I was a bench scientist for years through the 90s and into early 2000s. I got my PhD in molecular and cellular biology. And then after my PhD, I shifted back into industry and I started working in uh, research to support drug development and other platforms uh, technologies. So I'm really excited to see. I'll talk about it in a couple questions later. Um, at one point, I was a visiting assistant professor at Boston College. So I really enjoy teaching education. I became the uh, trainer uh, for a global medical affairs group in 2011. And that was my first experience with Duchenne. Unfortunately, there was a program that didn't, um, that failed. So um, when I came to PTC a few years later, I was very excited to be able to be back in the Duchenne space again and help support the community. So thank you for having me. That's awesome. Thank you. And drug development, I think, is so critical, especially in the neuromuscular industry. You know, timing is of the essence. So let me just start off by asking, you know, what, um, and John, maybe you could start this off. What are some challenges that you see companies have for developing drugs for such, um, you know, rare diseases? Yeah, rare disease um, as, a, as a space presents its own challenges. Um, one, if, if they're rare or ultra rare, you might not have a lot of patients from a, from a clinical trial perspective um, to, to study the disease. Um, and two, so with that is, do you understand the natural history of the progression of disease enough such that you can ask a clinical question? Because when you do a clinical trial, you know, you have an endpoint that you're trying to meet and you have to compare it to a placebo in most cases. So what are you measuring? 
Um, and if you don't have enough information, then that, that could be a challenge. So, um, so with Duchenne, for example, they, it was a big trial for Adalurin, our drug that we have um, uh, outside the US and Europe, where they did this big trial and, and enrolled a lot of boys and then understanding the natural history as the trial is going on and also trying to measure the effectiveness and safety of Adalurin in that population presented some unique challenges. So, I, I, um, yeah. What do you see, Craig, as a, you know, clinician's point of view? What's, you know, it's very challenging trying to, to find therapies, especially for Duchenne. Um, are there any challenges that you can speak to as a clinician? Um, yes, of course. Uh, the, well, let me pause for a minute. Maybe I should say um, something not a challenge. Um, it's as as I'm sure your viewers know, and this is a devoted community for obvious reasons. And mm -hmm. in a way, we don't suffer a challenge, um, at least in turn, at least we don't at Wash U. Um, you know, we have people that are coming to us that want to participate in experiences. And I, I think before we get into the difficulties of this, it's worth recognizing the commitment and sacrifice. A lot of families have participated in a lot of clinical trials. And, you know, the stakes are high, but the success rate is low. And I think everybody knows that going in. So mm -hmm. I, that is, I guess, that one of the main challenges is, you know, we're working not only with a rare disease, but we're working with children. Uh, we're working with families that have to continue to maintain their other obligations to their other family members, uh, to their jobs. Um, you know, they can't just drop everything you know, for the, for the opportunity necessarily. And the clinical trials by definition are rigid um, and, you know, they have a list of requirements that you really have to meet. So I think that from a clinical point of view, rather than a scientific point of view, the challenge is really just all about the logistics and the practicalities of trying to be trying to be respectful of the families that we're taking care of and trying to help them navigate this increasingly complex um, you know, opportunities in clinical trials so that people aren't selling the family home. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we have a bit of obligation to try to have a, a very well-rounded discussion with families before they sign up for these clinical trials about what's involved and what are the, you know, how it's supposed to work, what's the likelihood, what's the design. And that takes a lot of time and we're happy to give that time, but you know, it, it's complex. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. And I, I'm going to go ahead and ask Josh this next, but I just want to let our audience know if you want to uh, type in any questions to our panelists, feel free to. Josh, I wanted to ask, um, Ethan, has he had a clinical trial experience? Oh, you're muted. That's okay. Happens all the time. I've done it like three times today. <laughs> He, yes, he has been in a clinical trial. It was the anti-myostatin trial at the Rare Disease Research Center in Atlanta. And unfortunately, we saw, we still don't know if he received the drug because it was placebo and we, so we have no idea. But we saw things in him that he was really tired after school. Like he was falling asleep on mm -hmm. the way home from school. He was having to take a nap at school. And then we entered this trial, Ethan's not napping anymore. Interesting. You know, it's slow, you know, it starts building up his endurance and he's not as tired and he can do more things, you know, so yeah, and that trial will stop, but you know, we, we did see benefits of it and it, like he said earlier, you know, we can't drop everything when, you know, at, exactly. You, you have know. another child, but at the same time, you know, that's my son. That's my only son and whatever has to be done. That's what we'll do. You know, so if it is dropping everything, we bring her with us, no matter what it is. You know, I mean, we do it and we, we have to, because if you guys aren't fighting and we're not fighting, we're not going to get anywhere with this. That's so true. That's so true. Your overall experience with the clinical trial, do you think it was a positive experience from uh, doing that? I really do think it was positive. And we are looking into another clinical trial as well. So we're... We have, we go to his doctor in Massachusetts in November and we're going to be talking with her about other things that's going on and get more guidance there before we take the next step. But yes, we're definitely looking into getting him entered into another one. Okay. John, are there other areas where you can, as a pharma company, get more families involved in clinical trials? 
Um, I mean, we, we work a lot with the community. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, it's really just trying to communicate with the community what the needs are, what do we have in the pipeline. Um, you know, that goes to one of the questions we talk about with regards to, you know, what, what makes companies go into their very disease space. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have a very strong patient uh, focus at PTC in particular. So we have a whole patient engagement team that mm-hmm. interacts with MDA and other, and, and other, you know, patient organizations. So just trying to keep that uh, relationship going as, as strong as possible so that as we go through our clinical development, you know, pathways and programs, we can have information and communicate as appropriate. Sure. If that makes sense. Yeah. Josh, what would you recommend for families wanting to get into a clinical trial? Ask questions, reach out. If there, if you have one in mind and your child doesn't meet the criteria, there's probably something else now that they can get into possibly, you know, where years ago there wasn't any options, there are mm-hmm. options now. And that's huge. Exactly. Exactly. Craig, just, I put up a slide earlier, you know, now we have four treatments for Duchenne, you know, as you're, experience in the clinic and seeing all these families, you know, what do you see, or, uh, you know, what do you see in the future? Well, I mean, right now, just within the, the past five years, we've seen so much therapy change and drugs come to market. Um, as a clinician, what do you think of the future for Duchenne drug therapy? Well, it's, it, the first thing that comes to mind is the opportunity for you know, gene therapy or gene manipulation in some way. Mm-hmm. The, the hot topic is um, is gene therapy where you're using a virus to deliver a gene product or a, a genetic code to produce a protein. And uh, to me, that's very exciting. You know, the the just to be able to get a a protein to the muscle you know, by giving a virus. Is, is unbelievable to get give the genetic code to produce the protein into the muscle. Mm-hmm. You know, to compare to spinal muscular atrophy, where there are now three FDA approved products for treating spinal muscular atrophy, which is another disease, of course, that the MDA is involved with. I know we're focused on DMD, but sure. you know sure. that that the treatment of that disorder has changed dramatically in the last five years now that there is an effective gene modifying or gene replacing therapy. Gene modification or gene replacement of some form um, will be also the future for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's to me, that's the most exciting thing in, you know, the, in, on the horizon. There are other valid and exciting treatment pathways in terms of anti-fibrotic and anti-inflammatory pathways. And I think it's important to remember that this is likely going to take a multifactorial approach. I don't think there's going to be a magic bullet, but maybe I'm wrong. I hope there will be. John, did you want to say something? No, I, I, I agree. I, you know, um, when Craig McDonald spoke earlier, he talked about a cocktail. Um, and, and so for me, you know, when I, when I look back over the past five years, the molecules that have come forward as a molecular biologist, I'm excited to see these things like exon skipping, you know, Adalurin with read through technology, you know, coming into uh, the patients and then what is the future hold with gene therapy and other, you know, distro from producers. Uh, but I believe it will be a combination therapy and, and even for Inflaza, you know, and corticosteroids, you know, what is their pathway as a combination therapy with the other molecules to, as their immunomodulation you know, anti-fibrotics, distro from production. Um, and to, to the question you asked me earlier, also, you know, the, the families and the patients communicating with their physicians mm-hmm. uh, and the institutes as they work with the drug companies so that the, the three entities together, the families, the institutions and pharma, you know, working together so that we can have this future for the boys. Exactly. I think that's really evident. Um, when you see, when you go into a, one of the care centers, I know I used to be our care center specialist here and, you know, I would always meet with the pharma rep and the, and, you know, the, the patient and the doctor, and it is a very big team yeah. effort. And I think that's one of the things that's helping us to get to this drug development in the, in the future. Um, I wanted to get to a question that we got from one of our audience members. They're asking, um, Dr. Z, as he calls you and, uh, <laughs> And John Wing, will 50 skip work for 8 to 25 deletion? Asking because 7 fits to 51. 
or are we better off with a double skip six and seven? <laughs> can you see that? That's kind of hard to, to listen to and picture in your mind. If you can see, you can open up your Q&A window. I don't know if you, that might help. I have that chat window open and okay. oh, the Q&A window. The Q&A. I, I, I can't, hi Tushar, I cannot answer that right off the top of my head. I have to look at the graphic or type it into the, um, the uh, you know the skipping um, online software where it tells you how they skip. Okay. In fact, now it's vanishing. Oh, here we go. Fifty skip work for eight to twenty-five. Ask me does seven fits to fifty-one, or are we better off with a double skip of six and seven? So that five fits to twenty-six. I I don't think I can answer that. I, I'm sorry, not off the top of my head, not in a time efficient way. Let, let me make another, let me make a comment though that might, people might have thought of, um, which might address a similar question. Uh -huh. I don't know if this is what Tushar is asking, but I have thought and people have thought about maybe combining two exon skipping drugs. So like it would be possible for a particular mutation where you would need to skip two exons. So maybe you would take, you know, Exondus and Myondus, for instance, something like that. Okay. I, I would, I would, uh, that is not likely to work. Um, just to mention that I, I, the uptake into the muscle cells is not enough to expect to have both drugs uptake into the same cell with enough efficacy to double skip, so to speak. So I don't know if that's exactly what Tushar is asking, but I'm okay. trying to create a question I can answer. <laughs> John, I do want to. Yeah. John's uh, got that science background. Come on. Yeah. I mean, I, I am a molecular biologist and uh, I will say that I would have to sit down and like a board game, play with the pieces got and it. see what will work. I would agree that the likelihood of doing a double skip uh, is unlikely just because of the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of getting the two molecules and to then have it in a synchronous way that they both work. Um, but to, to get to a general question though about, you know, genetic testing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think as a molecular biologist, I would encourage everyone to understand as much as possible, what does your genetic test mean? And at least have that genetic information. Uh, but talk to the physicians because of all the specialty drugs that are coming up that work only for a certain subset of mutations. So for example, with, with Adalurin, with read through, it's only about 13% of the patients have uh, a, a in-frame stop code on. Right, so if you think about if you're on a train track and you're on a train going down the dystrophin path and you all of a sudden come up with the stop sign, okay, it's only for those patients that have that exact mutation that you can bypass that stop sign and have the train keep going, right. okay? Uh, for other types of, you know, double mutations, you know, deletions and conversions, it uh, learn just wouldn't work. So understanding the molecular genetic test you have so they can talk to a physician about the drugs that could potentially work. Got it, got it. Um, Josh, is Ethan on any therapy right now? No. No, okay. Right. He, he has a deletion of three through 43. So none of the exons are really gonna be applicable for him. Oh, so okay. the gene therapy and gene mutation is where we're hopefully looking next and we're, you know, that's what we're hoping on. Got it, got it. Hence, that's why you're going to go to Massachusetts, correct? Yes, ma'am. Got it. Okay. So John, Nicole, yeah. Nicole, let me, you know, I, again, I'm not sure how diverse the audience is that's listening, but. If, I don't if, either. I'm pretty sure they're all over the board. <laughs> if anybody wants to chat in what your deletion you've got, go ahead. <laughs> well, but I, I was going to even become more rudimentary than that. Sure, you know, go if, ahead. If, you, if your physician doesn't know or hasn't offered genetic testing for your son, that I, that's, that's something that should be able to be accomplished. If you've been told that your insurance wouldn't pay for it or there was a financial burden or a hurdle in the past and you haven't revisited this conversation with your physician, I would encourage you to do so. There are now ways in which genetic testing is offered for free for the patient mm -hmm. and my suggestion would be that everybody on the call should know what the genetic mutation is for their child. It is becoming, if it's not already obvious to the listeners, it is the essential question for how to approach the therapy for a boy with DMD and it will 
increasingly become the case. Yeah. So uh, that's probably several years already accomplished, I hope. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I wanted to emphasize the point for your audience. Our, our genetic counselor, Mackenzie Blair, was on earlier, and she also said, you know, you've got to have a genetic test in order to become part of these clinical trials, too, um, so they know what they're working with. Yes, that's right. And surprisingly to us, actually, having a first-degree relative with a genetic confirmed test is not always sufficient. And so we've had to have both siblings have their each individual genetic test done, for instance, when we have brothers. Each trial is unique. Um, but that can be um, a delay if it, mm -hmm. if it hasn't been done. Josh, has uh, your family members, other family members been tested as far as carriers go for you? Yes, my what? wife was tested and she is not a carrier. Okay. And, and before she got her results back, both of her sisters went and got tested as well. And they're not carriers either because they were looking to have children. They just wanted to see, you know, if they were or were not. And no one is in their family. Interesting. Interesting. He was one of those just freak mutations, you know, he, he's just special. <laughs> is he there today? He is, yes. Does he want to make an appearance? He doesn't have to, I just didn't know. I can get him to come say oh, hi. Okay, <laughs> you, we might want to say hi to him. <laughs> and uh, Josh, I'm up in, I live up in Boston, so if you come to Massachusetts, please go get some lobster or clam chowder, <laughs> as we say. Chowder. <laughs> chowder. <laughs> well, last time we went, we had tickets to the Red Sox, and it rained. Yeah. We didn't even go. Oh, I was devastated. So, you know, <laughs> and then we're going to have to make that trip, you know, during baseball season. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Red Sox, they were doing well. They're a little bit down right now. And, you know, the, the Pats are starting. So, if you come up in the fall, maybe you can hit the, the Patriots, you know, oh, the Patriots game. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the Tom Brady Patriots, though. So he's down in the uh, Tampa Bay Patriots yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I want to say about the genetic testing and if you look towards the future is, you know, at, years ago when I was teaching at BC, we used to talk about, or I used to talk about uh, gene therapy as like science fiction, which has now become science fact. And so the next wave then of gene editing and CRISPR technologies, if you can get down into that fine minutia of changing single base pairs, you know, in the future, I think even more so you'd have to understand what your genetic mutations are. So. The CRISPR technique has really, I think, helped a lot of folks um, with that. What do you see, um, Dr. Zeman, or Craig, rather, as you like me to call you, Dr. Z, what do you see, what do you see, uh, you know, what are you most hopeful for with the future, with the treatment landscape for Duchenne? Um, you know, Dr. McDonald did talk this morning about all of these, all these different fires, so to speak, um, that are out there that are, you know, just starting, whether they are from the beginning uh, of development or they're in, you know, phase two or almost to start phase three, you know, there's so many, so many options that are being worked on right now. What are you most hopeful about in the future? Uh, I'm most hopeful for the, you're right, there's a lot to talk about that's exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I am, I'm personally most hopeful for the gene-based therapy products and okay. The, I'm, the exon skipping drugs that are FDA approved, you know, there's room for improvement and there's active, um, active inv invest investment and involvement from the pharmaceutical industry to improve the efficacy of these exon skipping drugs. And theoretically, if we can just improve the uh, the way in which they get into the muscle cell and the way in which they work, they, they have their action in the muscle cell. I think that that's potentially a very powerful therapy, you know, on, on paper, exon skipping should produce a nearly full length dystrophin protein. And it, it just, when you look at the muscle biopsies, the upregulation of the dystrophin production is just marginal. And if that can be improved, I think that can really be a powerful treatment for patients who are candidates for this. And hopefully, if there can be improved uptake or improved efficacy of just one of these exon skipping drugs, that would then become applicable to all the rest of them. So if that domino were to fall, I think it would then quickly fall for the others. I'm curious to hear if John agrees with me. Yeah, That's, that I think is a very exciting area. The second area, of course, is in gene delivery. And like I mentioned, the, 
the early result from some of these microdystrophin gene therapy products suggests that the viral capsids effectively deliver the transgene into the nucleus and that protein is then produced on the order of 50% of the muscle cells when you look at these biopsies. And I'm speaking in rough terms here. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, the ability to deliver a genetic product to half of the cells in all of your skeletal muscles by a one-time infusion in the vein is, is incredible. Um, it, we, of course, now need to see if the transgene will make boys stronger. Dystrophin is, is a very large gene, and so it, it's not just you're replacing the gene, as, as I'm sure your, your listeners know. It's a, it's a modified, very small dystrophin gene product, and we'll have to wait and see how that works. And, and, and well, first, it has to be safe, of course, and then it has to work. So that's still quite a large hurdle to go, but hopefully that will work also. And I think those could be real, real hopefully life-altering um, therapies. They definitely would be. Definitely would be. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree yeah. with the... Um, yeah, basically uh, speaking generally, so drug delivery, getting the drug to the proper cell in the proper time in enough enough way uh, enough amounts that you have efficacy. So there there are a lot of companies, you know, generally speaking, that have antibody therapies that they connect to their drug as a conjugate, target it to let's say a, a particular muscle type, like a muscle cell, so they can get that molecule in there. One of the one of the challenges with these molecules early on, from just a research perspective, back in the their early two thousands, was people thought that like antisense oligonucleotides wouldn't get into the cells properly, you know. So 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 getting them there in a, in a higher amount to get more dystrophin production, more efficacy. I totally agree. And then for gene therapy, you know, yeah, what is the long term outcome? of the microdystrophin versus if you had exon skipping or molecular gadolurin, where you have more of a full length um, version of the dystrophin. Uh, you know, the, the dystrophin gene is just so big that the current, um, you know, current viruses being used uh, are very small. So I saw a picture of somebody packing, Mickey Mouse packing a suitcase, yeah. whole house yeah. in there. So I don't know if the, the other viruses that are available that can have bigger payloads, I don't know if those will ever come into play. And then once in the muscle cell, how long, and I guess, Craig, I might ask you this, how long do you think these uh, gene therapies, these uh, molecules would last in the muscle cells? You know, I mean, because how much muscle cell turnover is there over the lifetime? Because then it comes up to the issue of the redosing. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. The, the um, I think time will tell. Yeah. The, um, I, I'm going to dodge that entirely in terms of putting like a lifetime on this yeah. life or just, I mean, let, John, I think maybe instead, let's just highlight one of the concerns because it may not be intuitive to everybody. When, when you deliver a genetic product with a one-time dose, like what these gene uh, delivery devices um, are doing, these micro disc studies, you know, it's a one-time application and it looks like half the cells or so have uptake of the transgene product and produce protein, which is great. But the genetic code does not reproduce with the muscle cell. And so if that muscle dies, that cell dies, the, the drug, which is that transgene, dies with it. Yep. And the new muscle that replaces it will not have the transgene product in it. And so that's what you're talking about, John. Yeah, basically. And, yeah. And so the question becomes, how long does it last? Because yeah. it is a one-time dose. And more directly, when let's assume these drugs do work and they come to market. When should we give it? Does it mean we should be doing newborn screening and treating boys with Duchenne, you know, as early as possible? Maybe, but it's it, 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 it may be not because it's possible that the drug will have a lifetime for which it will then no longer work and targeting a boy at a year of age or six months of age may be too early. So there's quite a lot uh, to be discovered about these drugs and how they work. And people are working on that and, and I suspect also working on how to redose um, 
to dose a second time. Yeah, no, I agree. It'd be interesting to see how much of the satellite cells uptake the gene therapy. And then if you have it in combination with other therapies, the immunomodulation and you preserve muscle, would you expand that, life, that lifetime of the gene therapy because the muscle is still there? So it's, that's all, I think it's all good questions. We do have a question again uh, from Tushar regarding CRISPR-Cas9. Cas9 produces a smooth cut, whereas CPF1 produces a serrated cut, which means CPF1 would potentially, quote, work better than Cas9. Any research being done with CPF1? Craig, do you know? John. <laughs> John? <laughs> uh, no, I don't know specifically. John? I do know. <laughs> I, I have read articles. One of the issues that they're, you know, they're looking at with these types of technologies is sort of off target or okay. you know, not, we, we're away from what you want to do. And I know there are different molecules that are being discovered all the time in this field. So I'm sure that these issues are being studied. I just can't speak to it. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Josh, what kind of, uh, uh, I guess, you know, thoughts or comments would you give to all those, you know, Duchenne families out there with what is, you know, in your opinion, the future of Duchenne treatment? Embrace it. Do your research. Know that these people are working behind the scenes every day and they're not going to give your child something that's going to be harmful. I mm -hmm. mean, they're not. They're here to help. They're here to make our boys live longer, live stronger lives. And mm -hmm don't be scared. We were petrified the first time, you right. know, and, but because we didn't know, you know, I mean, yeah. we just know. And, but now, like I said, we had such a good experience. We are looking, you know, into another clinical trial. Mm -hmm. he, he's safe, you know, he's good. It, you know, things change for the better, you know, give, you know, have hope because mm -hmm. things will work out. It will. That's really good. Craig, do you see folks in your clinics that are, you know, hesitant to do a clinical trial? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, we, all the time. Yeah. Um, what do you tell very, them? Uh, well, it's a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. the, I'm, I, I, how do I phrase this? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. And I'm in the business of helping families maintain hope, but I don't sell hope. Um, and and when you when you want to talk with me about a clinical trial, I think it's very important to take a careful and thoughtful approach, especially because now with with uh, prednisone and inflaza different treatment regimens of both of those, and now all of the exon skipping drugs that are approved, it's possible that a family would decide not to use an FDA approved medication in order to become a candidate for an experimental medication in a clinical trial. And these are really difficult conversations. Uh, it's hard to tell a family not to start Exondus because they might be a candidate for a study three months down the road. Got it. It's hard to tell a family to, to go on daily steroids when they would prefer to be on weekend steroids in order to be a candidate for a study that's gonna open three to six months down the road. These conversations take a lot of time. Um, and I think it's important that family members know the difference between a therapy that is accepted, mm -hmm. what, what the expected outcome of that accepted or approved therapy is, and what is the promise of the experimental therapy for which they, you know, on the horizon. It's a bird in the hand versus a bird in, in yeah. the bush conversation, and it's really uh, difficult. Yeah. yeah, you are definitely weighing your options there. Um, we do have a, a question that came in. What is the view about disorder stabilization versus improvement? Steroids are an example where a delay in loss of ambulatation is considered as a success. You know, what's the goal for new therapies for clinicians versus family members? Who do you want well, to go first? Go, go, ahead. go, go ahead, Greg. 
Well, the goal is to improve the quality of life for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the ultimate goal is to try to normalize their strength and to allow them to live full and complete lives. The likelihood is that that goal will be approached in small steps and delaying the loss in ambulation or reducing the speed at which children decline, I think is a completely reasonable and acceptable outcome for a successful therapy, but it, it is not the goal for any of us. Um, so the answer is both uh, to Raju's question. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, earlier you were talking about the mover database that you're starting. Uh -huh. and, and, I would, and I would say that, you know, to me, it, it gets to the topic of real world evidence, right? So with corticosteroids, you know, over the years with the Synergy database, the CTAP database, you know, we've generated lots of real world evidence that could look at the benefits of corticosteroids versus being steroid naive. And so when you look at, we talked really about natural history and progression of disease and understanding that. So that first step then is, can we slow progression of disease? And with corticosteroids, real world evidence over a long period of time, because Synergy, for example, goes out 10 years, which is different than a randomized controlled trial, which might have a shorter time frame. So you understand that, okay, steroids first tell us that, or real world evidence first tells us that steroids will slow progression of disease. And that's step one. Step two, and this is what I spend a lot of time talking about, is then looking at the flazacort versus prednisone in that same data and to see that, okay, the flazacort can delay loss of ambulation better than prednisone, preserves hand to mouth. These are things that Dr. McDonald talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Also, the flazacort looks, uh, can delay the onset of scoliosis, which, which is a big thing. But what's the future hold? And so that's the, the future. So, that, so right now with standard of care, we're trying to slow the progression of disease. And then other trials, whether, you know, they usually require them to be on stable dose of steroids. I think that's what Craig is talking about with having families going on daily uh, steroids compared to high weekend dosing. So, but moving to the future, because again, the goal is if you want to cure the disease, but you have to get there. And that's unfortunately the nature of drug development. Not all technologies, I mean, the, the idea of a silver bullet that, you know, I learned about when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really exist. So it's okay. these baby steps of technologies and advancements and understanding. So. Got it. Understand. Well, thank you for that question. Um, Josh, is, does Ethan want to say hello to us? Uh, I bet he will. Let me go get him. Okay, you go get him. <laughs> Craig, I was just curious, um, you know, as far as um, Duchenne goes, there are, you know, certain certain aspects of the disease, you know, whether it's a younger kid or an older kid. Um, I guess we had gotten a comment earlier from a 30 year old, um, you know, with Duchenne, I guess was curious, you know, what kind of, of, I guess, advice would you give a 30 year old um, who has Duchenne? They've lived a long time with it. And, you know, we've got the future coming, but, uh, yeah, well, you know, there's, I, I, I like to talk about cautious optimism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to remain optimistic. Um, the, there's, you know, this, uh, a young person with Duchenne knows better than I do exactly what it's like. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think in terms of when you're, if you're an older young man with Duchenne and you're hearing about all of these clinical trials and you're hearing about gene therapy, which on the surface sounds incredible, um, and then you're seeing that these studies are only open for four to seven year olds, for instance, mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the frustration with that. The, but I, you know, a success in the Duchenne community is hopefully going to translate to a success for everybody. Um, but yes, you're correct. It, it, it may not in the same way. But um, I think cautious optimism is still, you know, appropriate. Most of the young adults that I have taken care of, and we, I have this discussion with them in clinic, have embraced that. They understand that it might not be for them. Uh huh. But they hope that it could be. 
and I, I think until proven otherwise, I, I, that's reasonable. Thank you for commenting on that. I just kind of wanted to touch base because we did have a couple older folks um, that were listening today. So I just wanted to make sure that, that we heard them. Um, we have one more topic or question that came through and then I want to just say hi to Ethan. What is your view, Craig, about um, Vemerolone as a safer steroid? Yeah, I, the preliminary data from Vemerolone looks exciting to me. Okay. I'm always, I'm always, cautious, you know, I like to see the whole cake before I want to sit down to eat it, you know, so yeah. the, the, I, I don't want to overstep what one can say, you know, it's still in clinical trials and, and but the information that I've seen about it looks exciting. The um, boys seem to have less of the typical steroid side effects and they seem to drive benefits similar to uh, currently steroids. So okay. I, I think I didn't mention Vemora alone because I did want to speak to a specific investigational product. I was trying to speak in generalities, but that's one of the more exciting and hopefully in terms of time, it looks like I think the study is going to close and result at the end of this calendar year, I think, if I understand the timing. I'm not involved in the study. Okay. So I think we should we could get results from Vemorolone, you know, on the quick, relatively speaking, and the preliminary data looks very promising. So I hope that that will pan out. And then, yeah, I could see a wide adoption of that if the if it turns out that the way it's described turns out to be the way it works. All right. Well, thank you for speaking on that. And then Gordon hop, um, hopped in on the chat. He says, "I'm 39." I hope we get some therapies. <laughs> so thank you for I saying that. Yeah, I think I we too. all are there. Ethan, how are you? Good. Do you want to say hi to everybody? Yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> well, thank you for hopping on. What do you think about all these therapies coming down the pipeline for Duchenne? I'm quite excited about these. These could help a lot of kids. And overall, hopefully, we can give it to all ages. Yep, I agree with you. I agree with you. Have you enjoyed your we summer? Yes, what you? What were you gonna say, Josh? As we we're fortunate enough that from early on, we've let Ethan make a lot of these decisions. You know, okay. we talked about the clinical trial. We told him what it was gonna, you know, be like the injections in the stomach and. Okay. And his response was, well, if it doesn't help me, it might help somebody else. So why, how could I not do that? That's so sweet. That is you know, so and, that sweet. At, and that was at six, you That's know, amazing. so it's, wow. it's, it's unbelievable. You know, so when we say that, you know, he gets excited about, you know, we've talked to him about possibly the gene therapies that are coming okay. and, and, you know, for him to be willing to, you know, go through the trials to endure, you know, the things that have to happen, you know, that just speaks volumes to, you know, how he is and how he wants to fight this. That's awesome. Thank you, Ethan, for being so strong. You are a great role model for all the Duchenne kids. Thank you. You're so sweet. John, do you have any departing words? Um, I just want to thank the community. Um, you know, the yeah, you know, saying early the challenges of rare disease and and ND and D the community is so active and I think and I think Craig spoke to this the community is so active engaged uh, in participation in clinical trials and and brave young men like Josh um, you know like Ethan there and you know I, I can't thank him enough uh, and and I I do hope that that there is a, a cure for this disease it's a relentless disease. Um, I mentioned the Mover database and the real world evidence because I think that's another way that families can get involved with generating clinical data and moving the science forward. So um, participation, communication, education, I think are all very important. So um, I just wanna thank you for having me here today and, and I'll do it again anytime you need me. Thank you, John. Craig, do you have any parting words? Um, like John said, I wanna thank everybody. It's a team effort for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I would, I guess my parting words would be, again, I'm not exactly sure what everyone's experience is out there in the community who's listening. Um, sometimes I have family members that are, uh, I don't, 
you know, that are maybe uncomfortable bringing something to me that I haven't brought to them. Mm -hmm. I can tell the community there isn't a doctor out there that doesn't want to hear from their patients. So if you hear of something through the MDA or through the chats or anything that you're hearing about, if you hear about a clinical trial, let your doctor know to see if you're a candidate. Let your doctor know if your son is a candidate for a, a medicine that you might have heard about. That it's a it's a two-way conversation is the way, you know, and I'm, I don't know everything, and I don't know every new drug that's being trialed at every place in the country. So I like to hear from my patients, and I'd encourage everyone listening to have that comfort level with their doctor to bring it up. It helps us take good care of your children. That's wonderful advice, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, you have anything to say? Um, I just want to thank you again, you guys, for your time. Uh, no problem. Thank you all for having us on. And if anybody's having any you know, they have any questions about a clinical trial, talk to Dr. Z, talk to your, you know, your doctors, find out, you know, mm -hmm. because it's going to take people like Ethan and all the DMD family coming together and doing these trials so we can get something out for everyone that has DMD so we can make their lives better and longer. I agree. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.